One. This is not something you can Google. I lived in a house in Beverly, Illinois. My home was built by John Horton of the Chicago Bridge and Iron Company somewhere around 1908. My friend was downstairs and she had always been a sort of medium. She used to see some Hawaiian guy who would help her channel her powers and understand herself. We were in the basement, and we had a speakeasy down there, which was pretty cool. My family used to hear parties happening downstairs, and when they would go downstairs, it would just be pitch black, not a soul in sight. There's only one way out of the basement, so you can't run away like that. My friend and I were downstairs when she screamed and ran upstairs. I was like, ugh. Another friend scared of my house. Great. She said she saw a man in the mirror of the bar wall. We had one photo of John from a newspaper stashed in a box of forgotten things and newspapers from around the time up in the attic. My stepdad asked her to describe the man she saw and it was the perfect description. He died in that house. She wasn't the only one who saw him. Many people, even people that don't know us and haven't been to our house, says a presence. I was once at a coffee shop a block away and this very frail old woman came up to me and said, You, you're the one I was supposed to meet here. I said, No, I think you have the wrong person. My name is Elise. And she said, No, I have a message for you from Ms. Hill, the lady who died in our house 40 years ago. What? She said, You are special, very unique and very special. And one day you will have your five minutes of fame. And I'm like, Okay, lady. I told my mom the story, and she wanted this lady's details. She thought she was maybe stalking us, but I never saw her again. What if it was Ms. Hill? Who fucking knows? The lady looked like a cataract death monster. She also told me I have three spirits attached to me. I never tell that to people, especially psychic mediums. Up until the time my mom and sister died, I was told I have three spirit guides. Or spirit sources watching over me. And since the death of my mom and sister, the number increased to five. Which I was just like, sure, psycho lady, whatever. So why would the coffee shop lady know that? Why would she approach me? A lot of friends say that there's something wrong with that house and that it channels awful things. I must say I fully agree, things just go missing. Doors open, the alarm monitor shows red lights in rooms where there is nothing. And every time you go to look, it's fucking nothing. I grew so comfortable living in that. I called the police many times. No, I'm not crazy. Maybe a little anxious, but that's about it. One time I was playing guitar at the bottom of the stairs, and I heard the loudest crash upstairs. Nobody lives up there. Nobody goes up there. We could literally remove that part of the house and it wouldn't matter to anyone. So I called the police. Fifteen squad cars pull up in five minutes, a man had escaped from the hospital nearby, and they thought he might be in my house. It was the same day as the St. Patrick's Day Parade, so cops were already everywhere. When they went upstairs, they said the fireplace grate fell. My cats were next to me, that's not possible. The grate was secure and had been sitting there for years. It never fell before. I will never understand why that happened. 2. A little context... I worked in a converted funeral home that also had an operating crematory for many years. It closed down two years ago, and my company took over. We use aquamation machines to process deceased pets to give ashes back to their owners. Further, we have cameras monitoring everything inside and out, and two large iron gates to keep the public out. I started working here in June. No one mentioned anything weird about the place, and it felt fine to me. We only have two people here max at a time, but usually we work alone. It is myself or my co-worker Jenny there during the day. The day I was hired and started working there, I heard lots of what seemed to be stomping on the roof. It was super loud, but she didn't seem concerned, so I ignored it. It was erratic and only occurs in the back office. The lights were shut off in us, and she just grabbed the flashlight and laughed. This happens sometimes. I keep those here in case. I didn't think much of that either. She mentioned to me, since the building is old, the breaker might be faulty, but they aren't sure why it happens. 
I later found out if the power was to go out, the machines would stop processing since there is no backup generator. Since the power goes off for 10 seconds frequently, but the machines stay on each time, we can't find out why, and the cameras show no one messing with the breakers. Also cannot explain why only the aquamation machines would stay on uninterrupted. We have heard footsteps running, breathing behind us, and get the general feeling of someone standing over us in the back office pretty frequently. After I mentioned this to Jenny, she admitted she didn't want to scare me away, since we are a smaller staff and it's harder to find people who want to do a dirty job, to be frank. I didn't blame her, and honestly, I'm not sure I'd mention it first thing either. The big boss decided to contact a paranormal investigator just to be safe, and they should be coming out this week or next. Only thing is, since that conversation, we have been forced to leave the building due to multiple instances where we just couldn't stand being there anymore. Me and Jenny were leaving one night after checking on the office cats around 9pm. As soon as we got out of our chairs, the alarm system started beeping like it does when we set it to arm and leave for the day. We just stared at each other in silence before getting out of there as fast as humanly possible. ADT, the company that we use for the alarms, cannot explain this or any future instances we had with it malfunctioning. I've heard what sounds like someone completely wailing on the machines three times, a loud bam, 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 while on the phone with my mother. Never heard that noise before or again after. Jenny sent me videos today of the alarm constantly blaring as if it was tripped to call the police, and the cats looking at the ceilings while it happened. I don't understand what or why this is happening. I'm hoping to find advice to discuss this further. 3. I was a security contractor for four and a half years, and worked both stateside and overseas. Most of our stateside contracts had us doing what some would describe as military police duties, just on a private level. Most of these locations are pretty rural, located in the western half of the United States, the kind of places you can still see the stars at night. This event happened in 2015 around May and was probably one of the most WTF moments of my career at that point. Myself and another contractor, Ty, were manning an entry point to a facility located approximately four miles away behind us. In front of us was approximately two miles of semi-flat barren ground, ended only by some hills. And behind us was the perimeter fence approximately nine feet high, topped with barbed wire, with the earth behind that matching the earth in front of us. So on a sunny day, or at night with a bright enough light, you could easily see 1,500 in any direction, with little to no concealment to anything larger than an extremely small animal. We sheltered in a small 12 by 8 shack, powered with electricity and that had running water. The front and side windows could be popped out and upwards, allowing fresh air in. So it was about 02.20 in the morning. It was sitting at around 60 degrees. Ty and I decided to turn the lights off both inside and outside of the shack so we could see the landscape better. It was a moonless night, slightly cloudy, the kind of night perfect for camping, but it was dark. I mean, beyond 75 feet, you couldn't really see anything beside lights off in the extremely far-off distance. As we sat there waiting for nothing, liking posts on social media, we both distinctly heard what sounded like a large quadrupedal animal approaching the shack which was odd, because neither of us had been briefed on anything like this occurring at the specific facility we were guarding. As we both turned around and began to look out the windows, neither of us could see anything but it got louder, almost like it was getting closer. At this point you'd expect to see at least an outline of something because it sounded like it was easily within 50 feet of us, but nothing. We were both confused and justifiably concerned. Neither of us talked. We just listened and communicated with our concerned looks. This is what really fucks with my head, and his to this day. The closer it got, the slower the steps got. And eventually it sounded like it went from being quadrupedal to bipedal. I'm talking it sounded like someone was now within ten feet of our shack, just casually walking around it. Believing our eyes to be deceiving us, we used the lights on our rifles to begin to illuminate the area searching our respective sectors looking for anything. These lights were bright, the beams easily reaching out 250 feet, not leaving much to the imagination, and yet, nothing. 
not a single thing or person. But yet, once we turned the lights off, the footsteps continued. I would have bet money I was dreaming if I was alone, but I wasn't. I had someone with me confirming what I was experiencing was real. We began to talk amongst ourselves. Night vision. Since we were working a night post, we directed to bring our issued night vision goggles with us. So we use those and start scanning. And we literally cannot see a damn thing. But we can still hear the footsteps. At this point, we actually are so concerned for our safety, we request help. In the meantime, we leave the shack, helmets on, night vision on, and search the immediate area. It's important to note, the night vision provided less long-distance vision than the flashlights. We disengaged the ENVGs and went back to flashlights. I mean, we searched, kicked over rocks, tapped our feet in divots, seeing if there was a secret hatch. Nothing. It took our backup 20 minutes to arrive in the form of two half-asleep supervisors in an ATV. We kind of agreed to make something up, anything reasonable. We heard those footsteps for roughly 15 minutes total, and I honestly don't know what it could have been. I worked that shack like four times before then, and a handful of times after, and nothing similar happened. What do you guys think? A shared delusion from late night exhaustion? Or do you think it was something else? Four. I did a four and a half year stint as a security contractor for a company which is pretty well known and well regarded in the industry. During the 2014 invasion of the Crimean Peninsula, after it was determined Russian contractors were being used to invade the peninsula, a certain worldwide military organization decided to be cheeky and send contractors in of its own. And I, an 18 year old only a few months out of this company's boot camp, was sent along with a sizable force of other contractors. Our primary mission was to slow any progress the Russians made while evacuating towns and villages of pro-Ukrainian residents who were susceptible to executions and other horrendous acts when their loyalty was discovered. Now I was only there six miserable weeks and neither of these true stories are my own, but the sources are very reliable and I trust that they wouldn't lie about such things. So the first one I'll tell is of Platoon 62. Platoon 62 comprised of two squads of 12 men each, and were solely tasked with evacuation duties. According to the two people who had told me what happened, P62 had called in at approximately 1445 hours, and notified command that they had encountered heavy incoming fire, and that they'd be seeking an alternate route to their destination, and reported no casualties. At 1452, they called in again and advised one truck had been hit by an explosive and that the vehicle was immobile. They said they'd be dismounting and moving to the other vehicles, reported that all five occupants had been injured but were able to move on their own. Multiple attempts to reach them fail after this. Two hours go by and the last call from them came in saying they had all been wounded, some dead, and that they needed medevac. 60 additional contractors forming a QRF were sent to assist at the first sign of trouble at 1445, and at approximately 1800 they had finally arrived, only to find all 24 dead in varying locations. So here's where the paranormal begins. The local state that a firefight had in fact started at around 1445, and ended after about an hour with the attackers making an aggressive push on the two squads they had ambushed. The locals state that they had gone out and checked on the contractors after the attackers had left, and found several who were still alive, but life-saving attempts failed shortly after. Most had been hit by gunfire and shrapnel multiple times. Fearing the attacking forces would return, the locals left. The locals were adamant that they had checked all 24, and that all had passed away before they had left. So who called in saying they needed medevac? It's possible someone lived and they didn't realize he was still alive. And he Roy Benavidez himself long enough to call for help. It's entirely possible the locals lied, or my fellow contractors lied. But regardless, I do know this. Platoon 62, not their real call sign by the way, was lost on that date and that time. All 24 were killed in an ambush because they had gone down a road we knew had been mapped out for ambushes. 
We know most of their equipment was damaged in the ambush, including most comms, and that the official information release states there were signs indicating someone had tried to save a few of them. Regardless of what happened, whether or not that last call from Medivac ever came in, we lost 24 great guys that day just trying to save lives. Task Force Blitz, or TF Blitz, or just Blitz as we called it, was a slowdown task force formed to do as mentioned above, and that was to slow down any advancement made by the Russians. Comprised of 150 contractors, it was formed early on, but my squad wasn't attached until I had been in country for about three weeks. None of this matters to the story, it just provides some background. It was not uncommon to be given maps that were heavily outdated, or that were not complete leading to confusion when stumbled upon roads or villages that weren't marked on our maps. Also, it's important to know that GPS was working, but due to the weather at the time, most of our GPS units weren't functioning properly or reliably. Hence why we relied on maps. While en route to an assignment, the units in the front of our column reported a small cluster of approximately 20 houses and buildings, approximately half a mile east from the road we were on. Of course, our maps didn't show this village. It was decided early on that since we couldn't confirm previous teams had searched this village, we had to search it again. And so my squad of ten and another of ten dismounted and approached, joined by two armed interpreters. My squad approached from the southwest, the other from northwest. Maintaining comms while approaching, we identified a gas station. About 15 total homes and apartment buildings, what looked to be a government-type building, and three buildings I couldn't possibly identify. So, little by little, we clear each building. Unfortunately, we find a few deceased people along the way. The researchers on our end find nothing. As we're wrapping up, the other squad comes out with two children and a dog. All three appear to be emaciated, and our medics began treatment while we established a defensive perimeter and waited for an evacuation platoon to come. The children were picked up. We carried on. Later on, I got to talk to the guys who found the children and dog, and this is where the paranormal begins. Whilst clearing out one of the apartment buildings, the members of the other squad who found them, D, interpreter, Ty and P. Ty and P were point, while D covered the rear. All three encountered a locked apartment door. Ty and P confirmed the door handle was locked and the door was firm in the closed position. So they prepared to breach it. When the door simply popped open before we could even get the bar in the door jam. Inside they heard what they perceived as an elongated whisper, which D stated was loud enough for him to determine it was something said in Ukrainian. He just couldn't confirm what exactly was said. They proceeded to hold their positions until additional contractors came to them. They entered the apartment and searched, and found the two kids and the dog in the living room closet, covered by several items of thick clothing. A woman was found down the hallway in a bedroom. She had been deceased for several days, if not a week at that point. Her injuries believed the result of a brutal assault. After the fact, before hearing this story, it was confirmed an evac platoon had visited this village about five days before, followed two days later by another task force. Neither reported finding the children or woman when clearing the village. Though it was determined later on, members of that evac platoon had committed crimes against women and children, and the time frame of when they were there lines up with her death. What stands out is the locked door. They confirmed amongst themselves it was locked, and they were willing to risk any element of surprise both to that apartment and everyone they hadn't cleared to break the door down before it simply popped open. I will say Ty and I worked together several times after our time in the Ukraine, and he established himself as a great contractor, and he exhibited a great moral character. I know from my time with him he wouldn't feed into a lie, so I truly believe this happened. As far as knowing truly why that door popped open, I believe that woman in the afterlife waited for her kids to greet them as they crossed over, knowing she couldn't save them, and did her best to protect them by locking the door when she saw our boys coming down the hallway. Perhaps she realized they were different. Perhaps she took a chance hoping they'd save her kids. Regardless. The last I heard, only the dog passed away. So she can rest knowing we saved them. 5. 
I'm starting off by saying this may not be paranormal, but I absolutely cannot explain what happened, and I'm struggling to understand what happened. I am also still super anxious right now, even though it happened hours ago. Me and my boyfriend like to do random shit at night, so I suggested we go on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Keep in mind, it was about 9.45pm. We drive for a little bit, and go across a medium-sized bridge. If you're driving at 45 miles per hour, you could get across it in maybe a little under a minute. And we see a man just kind of standing near the end of the bridge, kind of looking off in the distance on the bridge. I get a little concerned, because people don't usually take walks on the Blue Ridge Parkway at almost 10pm, or even in general and then stop on the bridge to just look off. I then tell my boyfriend we should turn around because I don't want him to jump or anything. We turn around. We're about two to three minutes drive away from the bridge at that point. So we turn around and head back in that direction. And I get a super bad wave of anxiety, just really bad vibes. We drive by the spot he was and he was gone. I was of course terrified, but you know, where did he go? Where could he have gone? We get to the other side of the bridge. And there he is, staring into the woods on the complete opposite side of the bridge. Maybe like 20 feet of a walk away from the end of the bridge. There's no trails over there. And I'd also like to mention it's pretty thick woods. He was wearing a backpack and a hat, I believe. And he was just standing there, facing away from the road. So we can't really see his face. So we drive back to turn around and leave the parkway to go home. And we fully expected to see him standing in a different spot, or the same spot, staring off into some odd place again, but he was gone. Either this was some strange coincidence that perfectly aligned to seem creepy as hell, or I just experienced something creepy as hell. What freaks me out the most is that we never once saw him move at all. He just stared at nothing. I'm freaked out, but also concerned about this guy. What if he jumped? What if something happened to him? I just want to know if he's okay or WTF is going on. I know people in my town are tweaking sometimes, but it didn't seem like that really. Dude was just standing, straight up staring off and then disappeared. There were no side roads around that he could have walked to either. We were a bit away from the nearest town, maybe 15 minute drive on the parkway. Real bizarre and creepy to see a guy late at night, being that deep into the parkway if he had walked. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 208. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. As of recording this video, I have an audience once again, I have missed them. Uh, keeping me company as I record, I'm not really back to normal yet. But I was recording anyway, and I figured having those guys there will motivate me. And sure enough, they, they are motivating me, and some, some of them are talking about toilet repair. Chat goes to interesting places. Uh, there will likely be no stream this weekend, however, though. Um, if there is, it'll be a little surprise thing. We'll see how I'm feeling. Uh, but yeah, you never know. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourself.